Hi, I'm Mark King, Head of Content for EMEA at Columbia Threadneedle Investments. Joining me for this episode of Eye of the Needle is Dara White, Head of Global Emerging Markets Equity, and Derek Lin, Portfolio Manager and China Specialist. We're going to talk about the major themes driving emerging markets and the current opportunities and challenges across those regions. So welcome to both of you. Thank you, Mark. Now, uh, before we get into the subjects, can you both talk us through your background and what you do here at Columbia Threadneedle Investments? Dara, maybe if you go first. Yeah, I'm the head of Global EM, as you said. I've been with the firm for about uh, 16 years now, so so uh, quite some time. I'm originally from Ireland, kind of grew up uh, between Ireland and the, the US as a child, but spent a lot of time traveling emerging markets. Uh, my dad was in the airplane leasing business. His regions of coverage were Africa and Latin America. So 2020 was a very strange year for me. I think it was the first year uh, since I was a young child, I didn't have a stamp in my passport. <laughs> Traveling to these countries, seeing them develop, seeing education levels improve, seeing quality of life improve, being able to uh, experience that, invest with those themes in mind has been a, a, a huge passion of mine. To be, be able to you know, embrace my, my love of travel, my love of seeing this development with my love of investing has been has been a blessing and I feel very privileged to be able to do it here at Columbia Threadneedle. And uh, Derek, can you tell us a little bit about yourself too? Of course. Um, so my parents are, are from Taiwan and, and uh, myself, I grew up in Canada, but I you know, spent a lot of time in, in kind of the greater China region, you know, visiting family and in summers and, and different programs and things. And, um, you know, what really became, you know, obvious to me was just, you know, how thing, how quickly things were changing over there. And it was such a vibrant atmosphere um, and that really drew me kind of to uh, to to make it a goal to, to really work in the region uh, in the future and so really made that uh, a goal of mine coming out of college uh, and that's how kind of you know find myself in in this uh, in this role here and uh, you know I work um, at Columbia I've been here for, for a couple of years now and, and work with Dara uh, on the EM side and, and the China side of things and um, you know I, I focus obviously on on China and the, you know the the way the team is structured, um, you know everyone else has a sector uh, focus, and I really work with the other members of the team, right? In in terms of having, you know, one of our ideas is having two sets of eyes on on all investments, and so anything in China, you know, I will look uh, and cover with uh, the other members of the team. So that's really my role here, um, and on the EM side, and then you know in in the China fund, I co co lead with uh, Dara as well. Good stuff. Now, Dara, straight away, I'm going to put you on the spot um, with what's the one thing that gets you most excited about investing in emerging markets? One thing is always hard to, to pinpoint, and I've been investing in EM probably since the uh, late 1990s, but it, I've, I've honestly never been more excited than I am today. And it's because of the quality of the companies that have come into the universe, right? It used to be a universe kind of dominated by state run companies run by government officials but today it's a, a universe that's dominated by you know privately run companies run by entrepreneurs and you know really well educated understanding the concepts of return on invested capital um, so i keep saying i feel more like a developed market investor than i ever had because the quality of the business models the quality of the management teams that i now get to interact with that we get to populate our portfolio with so I think the, the opportunities as an investor have actually never been better, despite you know some of the volatility we see, some of the headlines we see about emerging markets. I think a lot of the way people view emerging markets is kind of forward looking instead of instead of forward looking. Uh, so, so to me, the, the simple answer is just the quality of the, the companies that we get to invest in. So given the quality of that universe, um, maybe uh, both of you could share some some interesting long term trends and themes that are playing out across the emerging markets. So can you talk us through some of those themes that you're tapping into as investors? Dara, maybe if you could go first. Yeah, the the obvious big picture theme and, I, you know, I, I know it's something that you, you always hear about, but it's it is that emerging middle class consumer. Right. And it is real. Right. You see GDP per capita is going up in all of these different countries. But what's really interesting is the way you get to invest in it today, right? You're seeing technology come into these markets in a big way. And the adoption of technology actually happens faster in EM uh, than in, in the developed world in many ways, because the, the infrastructure isn't as well developed, right? It's much easier 
to to start using e-commerce and EM when you don't have a convenient retailer, you know, directly down the street, right? It's much easier to embrace fintech, for instance, when there's not, you know, ten branches in your in your neighborhood of of your traditional bank, um, and it's it's really exciting, um, and it, it, the just that that rate of adoption happens so quickly. Um, and there's there's so much money to to be made as as equity investors as you embrace that. And the other part of it is that it really a lot of these things really lift the quality of life uh, for that underlying individual in these countries. Yeah, and and Derek, well, I presume you agree with that. But but also, what other themes are you, are you seeing play out in uh, emerging markets? Yeah, you know, one thing that gets us really excited is um, you know healthcare, you know particularly in a China context. You know, I think the uh, the population is you know getting older, richer, and and unfortunately sicker, and you know that's just uh, you know it's a fact of you know where the demographics are headed. Um, but like Dara was saying, what what really gets excited is in terms of the you know innovation and the technology that um, you know some of the companies are bringing to the table. And um, you know if you look at um, China uh, in terms of the reforms that they put in you know since a few years ago, there's been really significant changes, some big 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 boom reforms that have taken place and. Um, you know, I like to kind of think about it as as a you know equivalent of of some of the um, as a WTO entry for you know what it did for China in 2001, and we saw you know a decade of exports and and boom of exports. Um, you know, similar things have happened in the biotech uh, sphere in, in China. You know, beginning with China gaining ICH membership, uh, which is a global group of FDA's. Um, you know, essentially harmonizing standards, you know, clinical trials and, and increasing cooperation between China and the rest of the world, which, uh, you know, obviously goes, um, you know, is kind of opposite to a lot of the headlines. But, you know, we're seeing a lot of increased cooperation uh, in this sphere. In the same time, domestically, China has changed the approval process to a yearly process. In the past, it's been kind of ad hoc, but probably a five year process. Um, and uh, reimbursement in terms of getting to centralized uh, insurance. That's a, now a yearly process versus you know a five-year process in the past. So for for drug companies, and and this is this goes for domestic biotech in China or MNCs, you can really build a viable business now in China. Uh, and we're seeing you know a lot of licensing of global drugs. Um, we've seen that taken off in the, in the last few years, and and grown exponentially. Uh, so there's just a, a ton of new innovation and opportunity now that you know some of these reforms have been uh, put in place and we're seeing a lot of opportunity not only in biotech and on the drug side of things but you know whether it's CROs, CDMOs, um, you know where or, or e-commerce in terms of drugs or, or medical devices there's there's tons of opportunity across the board uh, that we're really excited about. Some real progress on time frames there it seems um, but Dara it's fair to say I think that, that this time last year there was a lot of optimism around vaccines uh, the resultant upturn in, in global economic activity. Uh, in that reflationary environment, some may say that emerging markets would have performed well. Uh, fast forward to now, a year on, um, that hasn't necessarily been the case. But I wonder if you could elaborate on, on one, why you think that is. Two, are, are emerging markets the best place to play reflation? And three, how do you view value investing in emerging markets more generally? Some big questions there. <laughs> That is a that is a, a loaded question, and <laughs> you know, starting with the the uh, COVID slash vaccine front, I, I think I think that thesis has played out to to some extent. Obviously, we we continue to get different waves in different areas, and you know, emerging markets as a universe is is very diverse, right? You have you know some countries that that handle COVID really well at the beginning, some who struggled, some of those that handle it well at the beginning are maybe now struggling now. So it's very hard to paint and, and even uh, brush around it, uh, but you know you're right. This time last year, in the beginning of of 2021, a lot of strategists were upgrading emerging markets on the idea uh, of playing it, it a reflation trade. And I think you know the idea behind it has been right. Right, we're seeing inflation run hot. We're seeing interest rates you know go up in certain places. We've seen commodity prices uh, being strong. And I think the call to be overweight emerging markets would have been spot on in 2010, right? But not in 2021. And the reality is that the universe has changed, right? This is no longer a commodity driven, um, you know, inflation driven equity market, right? If you look at the universe today, it's probably 70% structural growth stories, you know, dominated by, you know, healthcare, by e commerce by platform companies in, in general, uh, by different consumer discretionary companies, uh, not by 
you know, the motley crew of investments that it used to be state owned banks and state owned energy companies and state owned materials. And that's actually a good thing, right? Because I think if you had been buying it for reflation, you would have been buying it for a trade that you would eventually move back out of. But today, given that it is a universe dominated by structural growth, by companies that earn a much higher return on invested capital uh, than their predecessors did, I actually think you can buy it and hold it for the long term and do much better as, as investors. I think part two of your question was about value investing in, in emerging markets uh, and why we think you know, that perhaps is not the, the best way to play it. And, and it's, it's not. Uh, we think you know, when you want to play reflation, when you want to play value, that you should do it in developed markets. Right. Um, the reality is, is that, you know, when you think about the traditional state owned enterprises in the emerging market universe, they still sit in those areas such as industrials, uh, materials and energy. And the reality is, is that there's there's always another hand in the piggy bank. Right. When energy prices go up or materials prices go up in these state run companies that dominate these sectors. Right. All of a sudden there's a new royalty or a new tax or a new, you know, massive capex spending. And th these companies within the EM context are just not run in a shareholder friendly manner, right? You want to buy the best in class companies. Those companies sit in the developed market world and that's the way to play uh, as an a value investor instead of in the emerging market world. Does that make sense, Mark? Yeah, total sense. Yeah. And it kind of brings in some things I've heard you speak about before about being being good stewards of capital as well, doesn't it? Yeah, that's that's our, our real focus. Right. So when we what we're doing on a on a day to day basis, myself, Derek, uh, Bob, Perry, Corey, Darren, we're sitting down and interviewing CEOs and CFOs of our companies, making sure they know the difference between investment A and investment B with their shareholder capital in terms of building a business in terms of building a, a barrier to entry, a, a moat, if you will, uh, and making sure they understand the concepts that drive you know, shareholder return over the longer term. And we find that the companies in those traditional value sectors, uh, I'm going to keep financials out of it because I think that that is a, a different a different beast and an area that we do find a lot of opportunities. But in energy and materials and industrials, kind of as a gross you know, generalization, they, they're lower quality versus their developed market peers versus these other areas that we get excited about. We don't see that discount in quality. And in fact, many times they're they're at par or even even better at what they do. Yeah. Uh, now, just before I bring Derek back in on on China specifically, uh, Dara, I'll just go for one more broad question with you. Um, I think uh, emerging markets have, have benefited from from you know the global wave of, of interest rate cuts and, and the stimulus we've seen um, in developed markets. Of course, we're now looking forward to a kind of short term future, at least of tapering and, and interest rate rises. Are you worried about a, a repeat of, of, let's say, 2013, uh, where we had the taper tantrums and, and the impact of the fragile five on emerging markets? Yes and no. Uh, I say yes, because I know others will worry about it. And often the reaction in emerging markets is to shoot first and, and ask questions later. Uh, but I think that will be volatility that we want to uh, buy into because the fundamental answer is, is actually no, right? The Fragile Five uh, don't really exist in the same way that they did back in 2013. Uh, the external balance sheets for the most part have, have, have been repaired. There are still some certainly some weak spots, right? Turkey, I think is a, a great case in point. Uh, Turkey for us actually is, is uninvestable uh, today. Just the, the macro environment, the political environment uh, it's very hard to decipher what the downside risks are, uh, other than know that they are they are probably exponential. Uh, so that's not a market that's even on our radar. The other one that you know seems like it would be vulnerable to me would be domestic South Africa. But again, it's it's relatively small part of the universe and and a relatively easy part of the universe uh, to avoid today. But the you know the Brazil's, the Indias, the Indonesias, you know those big current account deficits, the external balance sheets have really been reinforced. Um, and you know, don't have those same um, external weaknesses that they had back in, in 2013. So I'm sure it will create volatility, uh, but I think that will be a, an opportunity for the, the medium to longer term investor. Now, Derek, moving to, to China, the news flow clearly this year, uh, particularly around regulation, has led to, to quite a lot of, of volatility. Um, how do you view the current regulatory cycle in China? 
Yeah, regulatory has been uh, definitely a hot topic uh, this year and, and no uh, shortage of headlines. You know, I think the way we kind of think about it is, is maybe it's easier to think about in three different buckets. And again, there's not a clear delineation between the three, but um, just as a framework to kind of, you know, kind of think about it, I think it's useful. You know, the first is, is um, you know, obviously Internet has been uh, under the crosshairs of, of the government and, you know, the kind of the, the platform regulations and issues relating to antitrust. And, you know, I think there's a couple of... Um, points that are, are, are important to, to think about here it's, is one is, you know, the, these rules haven't been updated in, in almost 15 years in China. And obviously the economy uh, today looks a lot different than it did, you know, 15 years ago. And, and you know, a lot of the rules just weren't relevant. So in, in some sense, it, it was um, it was about time to, to actually kind of um, have a, a new relevant set of rules, um, you know, put in. And it was, you know, just happened this year that, that this was the time. Uh, the second point is also that, you know, a lot of these issues are, are global issues, right? It's not a China specific issue. And we've seen Europe, uh, you know, go through this earlier and, and the U.S., you know, obviously a lot of debate today and, and probably, you know, in the next couple of years will, will heat up. And so these are, you know, just the fact of, you know, these these larger Internet companies having so much, you know, kind of um, inherent power, right? Economic power, bargaining power and and how, what's the right way to regulate them. Um, and these are these are definitely, you know, kind of larger global issues. You know, from from an investing standpoint on this end of things, I think um, what we're looking for is is winners and losers, right? I think um, you know, in antitrust, obviously, um, you know, if the number one is is going to face headwinds, you know, we're looking to invest in the number two player, uh, right, in that space. And you know, we've done that in in some of our investments. And I think the second the second thing that we're looking for is just unintended consequences. You know, I think we saw this. The, the best example of this is in 2018, the past regulatory cycle, where in gaming, you know, approvals stopped. Uh, but upon um, the restart of the, that, um, you know, the, the barriers and, and the standards just increased. And so that actually helped some of the leading companies in the space and, and their market position actually got stronger, right, and, and helped them grow. And, and so I think, um, you know, again, we're looking for, for situations such as that to, to occur uh, in this round and, and, and kind of tailor our investments that way. Um, the second broad bucket, I guess, is this idea of common prosperity, um, you know, a fairer society, you know, equal opportunity. Um, and, and, you know, kind of a fair income distribution. And I think, um, you know, it's also relevant, you know, what it isn't, right? I think it's it's not, you know, egalitarianism. The government has pointed out, you know, in, in China several times that that's not what it is. And, you know, the idea, again, kind of the, to use their words, is, is not to kill the rich to help the poor, right? This is, uh, you know, more of an equal opportunity idea. Um, and, you know, I think, um, you know, obviously it's a, it's a headwind, Right, I think as uh, for equity investors, and I guess you know one of the things that um, you know has been, has changed is, is you know probably some talk around taxes, right? And I I just want to point this out because it it really puts into a proper uh, context, you know, what's happening. Um, so in China today, there's there's you know no property tax, uh, there's no inheritance tax, there's no uh, capital gains on securities, and the highest uh, income. Uh, bracket is 45 percent right and and you know obviously contrast that to here and i, I think that's uh, you know uh, just a very surprising starting point right for a lot of people and then in, in, the, in terms of the corporate tax as well you know some of the internet players have talked about kind of going from a 12 percent rate to 15 percent rate and the corporate tax rate um in china overall is 25 percent. so the internet you know giants because of the innovation that they bring is at a beneficial rate but you know what all those numbers are, are obviously is not startling, right? Within a, a developed market context, and so you know it is a headwind if you go from 12% to 15%. But you know I think the narrative, you know, a, a month ago or two months ago was that China was uninvestable, and and you know as you can tell, that's I think definitely not the case, right? I think we're moving to to you know from a, from a, a starting point that's probably too far to to something that's reasonable, and so. Um, you know, I think that we're we're looking at a, a situation where it's incremental change and not a, a paradigm shift in terms of this common prosperity kind of uh, theme. Uh, and then the third part is, I think, one where the actions have been um, more extreme, right? And this has to do with kind of miners and, and probably areas where it's more government um, run sectors, right? And I think that the, the primary example of this education, right, I think, again, um, uh, you know, I think in some ways this is a public good the, the government kind of viewed as a public good and relates to minors. And, you know, I think one of the things that the government is very focused on is, is um, you know, the health of, of minors and also just the burden on minors, right, from a studying standpoint or the content that they're um, consuming online or, you know, the restriction on gaming, for example, three hours per week, um, just kind of, uh, you know, it's a, a kind of a paternalistic, uh, you know, kind of 
uh, way to do it, but in terms of the the goals there, it really has to do with kind of the health of the miners. Um, and and we view this as kind of um, you know more sensitive area and and one probably to stay away from uh, in terms of you know from an investment standpoint. Um, and to be aware of, but I, I, you know, I think overall, I think we're 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 heading towards a conclusion. I think in terms of this regulatory cycle, you know, there's still some moving pieces, but um, you know, I think largely, the the things that government wants to do uh, are in place, uh, you know, today, and it's a matter of executing upon them. Yeah. If I could, if I could just add on to that, you know, a lot of the the commentary around China, around common prosperity, you know, think about that as as wealth inequality. Right, the regulations that we're trying to put in in the internet space, it's the same. It's the same refrain. It's the same conversations that we're having in, in the Western world. Um, it's just the the delivery, uh, perhaps, was maybe a, a little bit different in in China, and maybe easier to get things done, uh, just given you know the way the, the politics work uh, in that country. But when you when you think about them in in that regards, it, they're very similar problems, very familiar refrains. And just the the idea that this was an all-out attack on the, the private sector, it just really doesn't ring true to us, right? You look at urban employment in China, 80% of it comes from the private sector. You look at innovation in China, it's, it's probably greater than that 80% number. They can't achieve longer term what they want to achieve without embracing the private sector. And the government, you know, as, as Derek was saying, has, has shown this and has talked about that. And so we really do feel like the market you know, maybe got a, a little bit too negative and, and went too far to the bearish case uh, in China over over recent months. And that while it's it's still going to be some volatility, we think we'll look back on this time period, you know, 12, 18, 24 months from now and be pretty happy with some of the uh, the purchases we were able to make at this time. And do, it's interesting, isn't it? Do you, do you think that the delivery mechanism is a, is a little more abrupt than developed markets where things are telegraphed kind of quite far in advance uh, in terms of policy? Yeah, it's cer certainly certainly the case, uh, and causes a lot of volatility and a lot of frustrations for investors, but also um, also causes you know some some you know pretty significant opportunities, particularly if you're able to maintain a, a, a proper time horizon, right? We're not worried about where a stock is going to trade next week, right? We're thinking about who's going to come out the other side of this stronger, who's going to have gained market share, who's going to have more earnings power. And really trying to focus on those on those companies, uh, and you know, really just aligning your time horizons uh, with with you know how you want your how you think as an investor. I think is really important. I think it's something that people struggle with uh, when markets get get very volatile. Yeah, and Derek, some of the the statistics and facts around tax that you mentioned, I think they really are eye opening in, in a developed market context. Um, you know, re relative to to taxes, uh, corporation tax, et cetera, and DMs. It's, I think that is a, a real eye opener, as you said. Um, so, so Derek, as someone who's been, you know, a very successful active manager, where are you seeing opportunities in China right now? Yeah, the, that's the good thing about China is it, it is a large universe, right? And and so when, when you know, one sector or, or uh, one area of the market is, is kind of, um, you know, you know, kind of uh, facing a lot of volatility and some uncertainty, you know, there's a lot of other places to invest. Um, you know, one of the areas that we, we find very interesting is, is um, you know, the enterprise software or the to-be market, right? I think in, in China, the consumer-facing internet um, that we talked about, you know, it, it, it is quite mature and, and, and not to say there's no growth, but a lot of things that are happening are actually ahead of the developed markets when you think about, you know, live streaming e-commerce and, and things like that. Uh, but on the enterprise side of things, the to-be market, it's, it's the complete opposite, right? China is just starting. You know, a few years ago, there you know nobody paid for software, for example. Um, you know, it just wasn't part of the the user behavior. And, and today, still, you know, we're at a very early stage and penetration of, you know, software and and um, kind of the to be side of things is is you know one or two percent, um, and and far behind you know develop mar developed markets. Um, and when, when you think about again, I think one of the keys um, to investing in China is is you know investing with policy, right? And it's clear in this space that um, you know Beijing supports uh, development of of software, and they do want uh, you know a strong, vibrant uh, domestic um, you know strong uh, domestic uh, sector, and, and filled with a lot of uh, domestic players. Um, and so, one example of this in in you know kind of the office software space, you know, a few years ago, the government mandated that all government agencies had to pay and had to buy licenses, right? And and 
and that was you know very different than in the past when obviously uh, you know piracy has been a, a rampant problem in China. And you know we're seeing that trickle down right now. Larger co corporations are being uh, more strictly regulated, and and that should trickle down all the way to SMEs, right? In terms of um, attacking the piracy problem. So um, this is you know a lot of tailwinds to to the sector from from that standpoint. And and you know on the other side of things, it's you know a lot of the business, the positive business characteristics that we like from the you know consumer facing uh, companies. Um, you know they, they they maintain that in this you know in this realm, right? In terms of the network effects. Uh, in terms of the asset light business model right, and the high incremental margins and the scalability of these, um, you know, the, all these business uh, positive business characteristics are maintained right in, in, in this realm. So, um, you know, we found you know several opportunities, whether it's in the ERP space or, or office software um, or construction software. There, I think there's a lot of you know different opportunities that we're, we're finding right now uh, in that in that space. And Dara, that's that's just China. Derek's talking about there. I mean, emerging markets as, as a whole is such a broad universe of opportunity. Um, you've possibly got one of the most exciting uh, roles in, in asset management there, haven't you, <laughs> as we look forward? You know, I I, uh, I call it a more elaborate game of chess, right? You have, you know, 25 plus countries with 10 different sectors each. There's uh, a lot of opportunities for things to go really, really right. And you want to make sure that you're, you're overweight and, and taking advantage of that. And there are also opportunities for places to go really, really wrong. And when that when that happens, areas like Tokyo over the last three or four years, you want to make sure that you're you're not involved and that you you stay away from those areas. So, you know, thankfully, uh, we have a, a very experienced team, a very deep team, a very stable team. Uh, the firm provides us with you know um, really good risk models, uh, which really helps us make sure our best ideas are taking up the the biggest percentage of, of risk. Um, and it it certainly keeps us entertained. Uh, we have a lot of fun, uh, um, and you know we we do our best, and and you know we really just enjoy what we do. It, it really is a, a a good time, and very 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 intellectually stimulating. And, and true active management. Well, look, thanks very much for your time today, um, Derek and Dara. It's been a fascinating insight, I think, into the current state of play in emerging markets. Uh, that's it for this episode from the Eye of the Needle podcast team. A final thanks to Dara White and Derek Lynn, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Important information. This is an advertisement. This podcast is intended for informational purposes only and should not be considered representative of any particular investment. This should not be considered an offer or solicitation to buy or sell any securities or other financial instruments or to provide investment advice or services. Investing involves risk, including the risk of loss of principal. Your capital is at risk. Market risk may affect a single issuer, sector of the economy, industry or the market as a whole. The views expressed are as of the date given, may change as market or other conditions change, and may differ from views expressed by other Columbia Threadneedle Investments associates or affiliates. This information is not intended to provide investment advice and does not take into consideration individual investor circumstances. Investment decisions should always be made based on an investor's specific financial needs, objectives, goals, time horizon and risk tolerance. Asset classes described may not be suitable for all investors. Past performance does not guarantee future results, and no forecast should be considered a guarantee either. Information and opinions provided by third parties have been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. This podcast has not been reviewed by any regulatory authority. In the USA, Columbia Management Investment Advisors, LLC, CMIA, is an investment advisor registered with the US Securities and Exchange Commission. In Australia, issued by Threadneedle Investments Singapore PTE. Limited, TIS, ARBN number 600-027-414. TIS is exempt from the requirement to hold an Australian financial services license under the Corporations Act and relies on class order 03-1102 in marketing and providing financial services to Australian wholesale clients as defined in section 761G of the Corporations Act 2001. TIS is regulated in Singapore. Registration number 201101559W by the Monetary Authority of Singapore under the Securities and Futures Act, Chapter 289, which differ from Australian laws. In Singapore, issued by Threadneedle Investments Singapore, PTE.Limited. 3 Killiney Road, 
07-07, Winsland House 1, Singapore 239519, which is regulated in Singapore by the Monetary Authority of Singapore under the Securities and Futures Act, Chapter 289. Registration number 201101559W. This advertisement has not been reviewed by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. In Hong Kong, issued by Threadneedle Portfolio Services Hong Kong Limited, Unit 3004, 2 Exchange Square, 8 Connor Place, Hong Kong, which is licensed by the Securities and Futures Commission, the SFC, to conduct Type 1 regulated activities, CE. AQA 779, registered in Hong Kong under the company's ordinance, Chapter 622, number 1173058. In the USA, Columbia Management Investment Advisors, LLC, CMIA, is an investment advisor registered with the US Securities and Exchange Commission. In the UK, issued by Threadneedle Asset Management Limited, registered in England and Wales, registered number 573204, Cannon Place, 78 Cannon Street, London, EC4N 6AG, United Kingdom. Authorised and regulated in the UK by the Financial Conduct Authority. In the EEA, issued by Threadneedle Management Luxembourg, SA, registered with the Registrar de Commerce et de Society, Luxembourg, registered number B110242, 44, Rue de la Vallée, L-2661, Luxembourg. Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. For investors in the Middle East, this podcast is distributed by Columbia Threadneedle Investments, ME Limited, which is regulated by the Dubai Financial Services Authority, the DFSA. The information in this podcast is not intended as financial advice and is only intended for persons with appropriate investment knowledge who meet the regulatory criteria to be classified as a professional client or market counterparty, and no other person should act upon it. Columbia Threadneedle Investments is the global brand name of the Columbia and Threadneedle group of companies. ColumbiaThreadneedle.com